Does anyone still believe that cheaper iPhones or more Amazon deliveries of plastic garbage from China are going to make us happy? They haven't so far. A lot of Americans are drowning in stuff, and yet drug addiction and suicide are depopulating large parts of the country. Anyone who thinks the health of a nation can be summed up in GDP is an idiot. I, I wanted to read something short. I should have brought this up earlier, but I think it's powerful. Uh, Brett Stevens, that creep at the New York Times, uh, wrote a column ridiculing uh, Tucker Carlson's uh, now famous denunciation of unbridled market capitalism. This is a comment from the New York Times, uh, from scholarship boy, he calls himself, in flyover country. Brett, I'm from a low caste background in the Midwest and currently attend your alma mater in Chicago. That would be the University of Chicago. Cost of attendance is an eye-popping $78,000 per year, and the majority of teens walk around campus in Canada Goose and Monsieur Parkas, which retail for $1,200 to $12,000, sorry, $2,000. Several times last quarter, my classmates would party, lose their posh parka, and chuckle about it the next morning. Back home over winter break, in one of those downscale, olive garden-equipped, opioid-plagued places you made fun of, via proxy characters. Over 1,500 desperate locals just waited in freezing temps to apply for 300 positions at a new factory. The pay, 13 bucks an hour. Back of the envelope math tells me four or five weeks of net wages for a lucky local man to bootstrap his way to one of the parkas my teenage classmates casually laugh off losing. Thanks for this landscape, elites. It's worth noting not all Tucker fans are Fox News viewers. I find Tucker clever and he's a talented writer. With little promotion, his new book was number one on your employer's bestseller list, Puzzling. As you seem to dog whistle, the gullible rubes tuning into his show are too low watt to read. It's no secret to viewers, he's a silver spoon wasp, lives in a fancy neighborhood, and probably sends his kids to prestige schools. Maybe he's just an opportunist showman, or maybe he has some authentic compassion for struggling fellow Americans. Either way, he's tapping into authentic concerns. Look, if the Republican Party could tap into this disaffection, there would be a generational shift in American politics, and they would be in charge of America for a generation in the same way that FDR exploited the alienation caused by the Great Depression. Uh, two problems with my suggestion. One, the Republicans are stupid, and two, they are traitors. I'm going to suggest that if the Republicans don't get ahead of this movement, somebody else will. You see the, uh, the right, the traditional right, the GOPE, the Paycheck Conservatives, screaming like scalded cats about Tucker Carlson's uh, essay. And there's a reason why they're doing this, apart from their wounded amour propre, which is they know there's no support for their position. We talked earlier about this, that Pew Research locates the Americans, uh, the amount of Americans who support uh, this uh, so-called, you know, fiscally conservative, uh, socially liberal position is 3%. 3%, 3% of the American population. This, this Chamber of Commerce position, this Koch Brothers uh, Cato Institute National View position has no popular support. Uh, the Republicans get paid off. They get paid off by donors uh, while they're in office and then they get hired uh, by uh, K Street lobbyists, huge salaries to further poison uh, the country which they were allegedly serving. There is money here on the table. There is more than money here on the table. There is power. There is power for a generation. Someone is going to take that off the table. If not the Republicans, some new party. So January 28, 2016, Tucker Carlson wrote for Politico, Donald Trump is shocking, vulgar, and right. Consider the conservative nonprofit establishment, which seems to employ most right of center adults in Washington. Over the past 40 years, how much donated money have all those think tanks and foundations consumed? Billions? 
Has America become more conservative over that same period? Come on. Most of that cash went to self-perpetuation. Pretty embarrassing, and yet they are not embarrassed. Many of those same overpaid, underperforming, tax-exempt, sinecure holders are now demanding that Trump be stopped. Why? Because as his critics have noted in a rising chorus of hysteria, Trump represents an existential threat to conservatism. Let that sink in. Conservative voters are being scolded for supporting a candidate they consider conservative because it would be bad for conservatism. And by the way, people doing the scolding, they are the ones who've been advocating for open borders and nation building in countries whose populations hate us and trade deals that eliminated jobs while enriching their donors. Yeah, I think of Jonah Goldberg and that whole class. And I'm reminded of the scene in Office Space where uh, the, the two experts, the efficiency experts come in and they're grilling this guy about his job and he's trying to explain what he does and he's, he's nervous, but he, he's not doing a very good job. And it would appear that, you know, that his job doesn't make any sense, that it's uh, not necessary. And one of the bobs, as they're called, what is it that you do? This is my question for Jonah Goldberg. What is it that you do? I mean, I believe Jonah Goldberg has been at this, uh, at the National Review level for something like about 20 years now. What can he point to? What are the victories of the so-called conservative movement in this time? And I don't consider the conservative case for gay marriage uh, a victory. I don't consider the conservative case for transsexual acceptance uh, victory. I don't consider the uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq to be a victory. What are the victories? Let's go back to the founding of National Review itself in the mid-1950s. What have these people ever accomplished? It's a serious question. It's not just an insult. What have they accomplished? Now, obviously, there are other factors at work, but the uh, conservative movement has been uh, prominent and well-funded since the uh, 1950s with William Buckley and his National Review. Let's compare America in the mid-1950s to America today. Now, how in any way has the conservative movement worked to conserve that which was good about the America of the 1950s? How was the conservative movement not an utter failure in every regard? Dennis Prager has a good column this week It's called Mitt Romney Fails Again. Prager notes that in 2012, I campaigned for Senator Mitt Romney when he ran for president, including a closed-door meeting with him to raise funds among wealthy Los Angeles Republicans. As it turns out, I worked to elect a somewhat foolish man with few identifiable convictions. So what did Mitt Romney seek to achieve by publishing an attack on his own party's president in the Washington Post, a Trump-hating newspaper? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than addressing whether the United States has borders secure enough to prevent millions of people from coming to America illegally? Does Mitt Romney believe attacking Trump is more important than the left suppression of free speech at virtually every American university and the left suppression of free speech on the internet? Does he believe that attacking Trump is more important than the left's ongoing attempt to abolish male and female identities among children? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than attacking the left's goal of weakening the American military? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than attacking the gargantuan size of the federal government? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than attacking the left for essentially destroying the Boy Scouts? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than the dramatic decline of religion in American life? Does he believe attacking Trump is more important than preventing the left from dominating the country's federal courts? And if he does, he may be more than a fool, something that may involve character defects. Given his attack on the president rather than on the left, uh, we what's going on with Mitt Romney? And uh, one character issue that's probably going on is a lack of courage in today's environment. It takes no courage to attack Donald Trump, especially in the Washington Post. Another character issue with Mitt Romney is pettiness. 
now seems very hard to deny that Romney resents Trump for doing what he, Mitt, failed to do win the presidency. Third character problem with Mitt Romney is a lack of conviction. What does he stand for? Prager notes, when Donald Trump sought the Republican presidential nomination, I was convinced he had no ideology and I could not identify any convictions. I therefore opposed his nomination. But I vigorously supported his campaign for president and hoped my original assessment was wrong. Lo and behold, Trump turns out to have the most solid conservative convictions of almost any Republican politician since Ronald Reagan and an almost preternatural amount of courage to put them into practice. Kevin? I think that's true. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at what happens in life, there are three factors uh, which are continually underrated, and they are one, boredom, and number two, spite, and number three, the imp of the perverse. Now, reading this stuff from Charlie Sykes and the other ne uh, Never Trumpers, Jonah Goldberg, today, I thought these, they never attacked Obama half as hard, a quarter as hard, a tenth as hard as they're attacking Trump. And there's a reason for that. Because Obama was good for them. Because they liked the direction in which Obama was pushing the country. And they could always signal in their controlled opposition way against Obama. It meant more donations for them. Oh, this Obama, you have to give money to National Review because Obama is wrecking the country. We're not doing anything to stop it. And we're going to support presidential candidates, Senator McNasty, and then Mittens, who aren't going to win because they're not meant to win. But, uh, you know, that's the nature of uh, manufactured consent and controlled opposition. Trump did something which wasn't supposed to be able, that anyone uh, was able to do. That he said what was on his mind. He made uh, controversial assertions. He uh, rubbed uh, powerful people the wrong way. He came out against the invasion of Iraq. He came out against the Bushes directly, saying embarrassing things like 9-11 happened on their watch, which you're not supposed to point out because, of course, people, aren't, uh, people weren't held responsible for 9-11. No one got fired. A single person got fired. When Clinton, uh, near the end of Clinton's presidency, you might remember this, Luke. There was a, a single engine plane, a Piper Cub or something like that, which was buzzing the White House. Yeah. Now people would have put two and two together. Hmm. Hmm. Federal buildings are at risk by a direct attack from planes. How are we going to protect them? Nobody did anything. Nobody did anything. Uh, and Trump, you know, he points things like this out which is supposed to be political death. It wasn't political death because people are so fed up that a man as um, loud and vulgar and outrageous as Trump found an audience. He found an audience. I, I mean, these conservatives, blah, 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 my free market, blah, 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 smaller government. <laughs> we don't really mean it. Why would anyone pay attention to that anymore? There is only so long you can keep on beating a dead horse, and that is the conservative movement beating a dead horse.